Hello, hello, it's John Mark Dub, your friendly neighborhood layman, hitting you with the word again. Thank you guys for tuning in. So glad you guys are here. We're going to continue from where we left off last, last time. We was in Exodus number one last time, so now we are in Exodus number two. You guys know how it goes. There have been many lore, many stories, many uh, forms of entertainment, movie, animes, video games, you name it. They got some awesome stories with an actual mor moral to it. But as time progresses, you know, we see these weird type of constructed stories that just want a reaction out of you. Not a good one, not a bad one. They're just trying to make you feel something. And they are morally gray and they are crocs of crap. Now, usually every story gets a little something something in one form or fashion from the Bible. Guaranteed. The Bible is the source to a lot of the inspiration that people have for their movies and shows and whatnot, whether they want to admit it or not. A concept is gotten from the Bible, whether that be family, whether that be something about a church or God's house, whether that be something about life or the issues. Anything a person has ever went through, hard, good, bad, whatever it is, it was written about already. And the Bible is a book that it's in. That's why this Bible is, unlike those other things, actually real. And it can change your life. During COVID-19, the Lord has prompted me to do this. And so I said, Lord, I'm going to do this. I've been doing this ever since Genesis 1. Doing biblical analysis videos. And uh, have the introduction like I'm having right now. We're going to read it, analyze it, and then we'll pray at the end for those who need prayer. And... Um, it's really a wonderful thing, and as long as it's within my power to do this, I am going to do this, because the Lord said do it. Now, I am not a pastor. I have to put this up in a disclaimer. I am not a pastor. I am not a prophet. I do not hold that office. I do not shepherd people, okay? I understand that's a very big responsibility, and it cannot be taken lightly. I am just a layman. That's why I say you're friendly neighborhood layman at the beginning of the video, so you know what's up. I'm somebody who loves the Word of God. Jesus Christ has changed my life. And I do understand that as a Christian, a normal layman, a Christian, you do have a responsibility that Jesus Christ told everybody, not only the preachers, okay? He told everybody to share this gospel with everything that breathes. Every people group has a right to know of the truth that is in this Word. And moving forward, that's what we're going to do, guys. I have made a uh, few videos. I'm not really new to this now. I mean, I am kind of new. I wouldn't say I'm a pro or anything like that, but I've learned and got this down to a science where it's not going to take up too much of your time. So, I don't like wasting my time. Don't like wasting God's time. Nah, don't want to waste your guys' time either. The Lord loves you, and he wants you to listen to this. He wants you to hear this. So, if you're listening to this right now, it is not by accident. Please, like and subscribe. Uh, be notified for more future biblical content and music cover videos that I do do for fun and I love to do those things all kind of music from all kind of different things shows video games uh you never know maybe a movie score I don't know whatever just music that I like and I'm able to do it and uh do that on my keyboard or with my voices or a combination of the two that's just what I like to do so this channel also has some fun stuff on it as well uh but the bible is fun already at least it's fun to me I mean I enjoy talking about it I love it. Been reading it since I was a kid. I was forced to read it at first. Hated my parents for t telling me to do that. But then I started to appreciate my parents for letting me do that because of the truth that I found in God's word myself just from reading it. I mean, it just prepares you for life in all types of situations. You could say, oh, shoot. What did Moses do in this situation? Oh, shoot. What did Jesus do in this situation? Oh, shoot. What did Abraham do in this situation? Oh, what did uh, what did Paul do when he was getting, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just gives you a reference point to reference off of. And you just do what you read and what you know God likes. And that's right. You know what I'm saying? And I think the sooner people know how to do this, the better they are. This is why the Bible says, train the child up in the way they should go. And when they get older, it won't depart from them. I forget what chapter and what verse that's from, but if you know, you know. You know what I mean? That's basically what it says, and it says that for a reason. You know, not saying that older folks who get saved can't, you know, uh, 
serve God and do a good job at serving God. It's just that it will be, they're going to have to unlearn some things their whole life, whether 20, 30, 40 years of their life, they've been doing stuff a certain way and now they have to change. And of course, they're going to want to in order to even go to the Lord and say and acknowledge that they're missing something and that they need the Lord God to take away their sin. So anyway, there's going to be an opportunity for all of those wonderful things at the end of this video for healing, for prayer, those people who want to come to Jesus Christ and get uh, and let him come inside of your heart so he can live inside of your heart and take away that sinful lifestyle that you may realize by the end of the video that you may have. You may not have a sinful lifestyle. You may be a Christian already, or you may be somebody that knows about what I'm talking to. For some people, I may be preaching to the choir. You guys know already. There may be others. It may be your first time hearing this. So I have all types of different listeners. So just letting you guys know what's up before we get into it. So now we're going to just get right into it without further ado. The material safety data sheets. Everyone has a right to know those things. Those things are posted in workplaces all over the world. It gives you instruction, line per line item instruction on how to do things, on how to clean things, on how to mix certain chemicals. It makes sure it's, you know, idiot proof so nobody messes up and gets themselves killed or other people killed on the job. Workers have that responsibility to, uh, employers have that responsibility to their employees about how to do that. So, with this Bible, the Creator, you know, made this thing here. It's not meant to sit and collect dust. It's meant to give you line per line item on how to live this life righteously according to the moral standard that God has provided for us to let us not have an early death or spend eternity in a devil's hell. So, to me, that's quite important. So now, without further ado, let's get into it. The birth of Moses. I have the New Living Translation. You guys follow along with me. If you have your Bibles, please follow along. It keeps everyone honest here. Make sure that I'm not spewing out my own nonsense. Make sure that I am reading from this written Word of God. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, download the Bible app. You can pause this video, download that app on your device real quick. It is free and costs you nothing. Read the Bible even when you're not listening to my videos. Read it as much as you can. Heck, don't even take my word for it. Let every devil and every man be a liar. Let God's word be true. This, excuse me, <clears throat> this is the attitude you have to have when looking at God's word. Okay? That lets you know that God's word is the standard. No other book no other way, no other opinion, God's word. And that's what I'm reading from. Okay. Oh, yeah. Also, I decided not to show pictures, at least for a while. N number one, the pictures are kind of taking up some space on my device. So, <laughs> it's a lot of pictures I'm getting. It's taking up space on my device. I'm going to have to eventually get another device sometime here in the near future to house all of this data, all these videos I'm making and all these pictures that I'm getting. Number two... Some of these pictures say they could be subject to copyright. Now, I'm not making any money off of these things. I'm not making any profit from this. So even if somebody wanted to sue me, I've got no money that, that I made from their stuff that they could sue me off of. So I'm kind of not worrying about that, but I just don't want to get caught up with that. Then also, a lot of these pictures, they do not depict it as it probably should be depicted. This, These pictures of how these scenes looked from the Bible... Is from somebody's imagination of how they see it. And then they're drawing it. So we're not saying that it didn't happen. It just didn't look exactly like these drawings that I'm showing you. These drawings are beautiful. If you want to see these pictures and artworks on your own time, please do. But from now on, I probably won't show that. Only because I think it takes away from the awe, the mystery, and the wonder of the word and what it is saying in the Bible. I just don't think these pictures truly can depict what really went down. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think these pictures, as beautiful as the artworks and pictures are, do not do the Word of God justice. So I will not be showing pictures, <laughs> at least for a while, um, you know, for those reasons that I've mentioned. Okay, now enough talk. Let's get into the Word here. The birth of Moses. All right, Moses is born. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus, reeds, and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. 
She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. Okay, so this is really awesome. This is really awesome right here. So it's kind of depicting on what uh, uh, Yohabed, that's basically uh, uh, Moses' mother, what she did in her, you know, her sister, is uh, his sister, is watching the, her, their mother drop Moses in the water after, you know, she has done this. Now, this Pharaoh, it's something how he did not really care for the Jewish men. And I think now I see why. He had a daughter, okay? Well, you're talking about the princess of Pharaoh here. Now, you never know. Maybe the princess of Pharaoh, you know, maybe she liked the Jewish guys. Maybe she's like, oh, wow, he's kind of cute, you know, whatever. They're kind of cute. They're hardworking and nice men and everything like that. Well, at this point, they were already enslaved. So, you know, I guess, you know, that's just going to kind of make sure that his daughter doesn't marry one of the Hebrew people or the Hebrew men because they're slaves. You're royalty. You don't, royalty doesn't marry slaves. Booyah. So I blocked her from even thinking about doing that. Right? And so you got to realize this Pharaoh is a different Pharaoh. He's got different, he's got insecurities. You never know. He's obviously him and a lot of other, other Egyptians are alarmed about, you know, the rate at that the Hebrews were doing it, but this is way, way in the future from when we read one chapter over in my last video that I made, Exodus 1 analysis. So you got to understand this, this may even be not the same Pharaoh. This may be a different Pharaoh. You never know. Um, this is the later part of the 400 years that the Hebrews are enslaved. So you have to think about that. Moses is going to grow up. Um, and from my, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong here, you can do it in the comments, but Moses spends 40 years in Egypt, then he, spend, he spends 40 years away from Egypt, and then around that 80th year is when he comes back to Egypt to get his people, and then, so he's like 80-some when, or 80 when he leaves Egypt, Right? And then God kept him alive to like live like a, to 120, I think. So then he spent, what is that? 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. So that's 40 more years that he was alive after he got the people out of Egypt. If I'm correct, because I remember reading that. Anyway, we're going to get into that later. We're kind of fast forwarding here. But Moses is born now, and so yeah, I, I mentioned that because you know the, the princess is is you know she's you know he's got a daughter, and maybe for the simple fact he didn't want his daughter marrying a Hebrew, he didn't want a Hebrew person in the family, so maybe that's why he um you know didn't like the Hebrews. I mean you know everybody has their own reasons for hating folks and disliking folks, so you know you never know that could be one of the reasons. We never will know the exact reason, but the fact is he was afraid of them taking over Egypt and if their enemies attacked them, they would be their own separate nation and say, hey, you know what, we're going to take, take you out, man, because, you know, you know, we don't like you. Like, just out of nowhere. Like, why would they do that? You know what I mean? Fear. The devil makes people fear and fear makes people do stupid, silly, dumb things. They, they don't act rationally. And it was irrational to treat these people with so much hatred for no freaking reason. Okay, let's continue. So soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. So wow, that's something how they, they knew about that this may be one of the Hebrew children. So, you know, there was a definitely distinction about them 
and the um, and the Egyptian children. You know what I mean? So they 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 knew. You know what I'm saying? Then the baby sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes, do. The princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Cool. Moses escapes to Midian. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. So this is really cool. So Moses understands he's a Hebrew. He was told he was a Hebrew. Princess's daughter, uh, Pharaoh's, <laughs> Pharaoh's daughter, the, uh, the princess of Egypt, was obviously she raised him as his own. And so, you know, Pharaoh being Pharaoh, he wants his family to be happy, I guess, at least, even though he's, a, you know, a sinner, you know, every dad wants his children to be happy, right? So in his mind, he's probably thinking, okay, you have a slave baby you want to take care of. Fine. No worries. Do whatever you want. It matters not. I used the British accent, but I know that's, that's not how the Egyptians talked, but I don't know why I use that accent. Ugh. That is, <laughs> that is con system conditioning. You know, they have to be royalty. They have to be high authority. They have to be somebody special if they have a British accent, right? Not, not saying anything bad about the British, but that's just the conditioning of society. And these, there's a lot of biblical movies that do that. And it's just, you know, we know good and well the Egyptians were dark black or brown. They were not... White. I'm not saying that there were never any light-skinned Egyptians that existed. I'm sure there were a few. I'm sure there were a few. You had people who were, you know, there were all kinds of people in the world. You had Greek women marrying Egyptian men and vice versa. Egyptian women marrying Greek men probably. And so you had the mixture of Greek and, and Egyptian babies probably. And so, you know, this world has all different kinds of people in it. You cannot say Egyptians were only one thing and you cannot say the Greeks were only one thing. You cannot say that there's only one type of person in this one type of area. You know, that's that's how media and stuff has clouded us. Oh man, it, it, it works against us, the, the normal media. Scotland only shows white dudes in kilts playing bagpipes, but there are many brown and even dark people that live in Scotland. Same with the UK, same with any other type of world, uh, place in the world, like, you know, you know, like Middle Eastern people aren't the only people that live in the Middle East, okay? That, you know, uh, America is full of all different types of people from all different types of walks of life. So, you know, it's just, you know, a lot of people get hung up on the race thing and, you know, that shouldn't happen. You know what I mean? But, hey, that's one another reason why I stopped showing pictures because the pictures depict something and it just ain't going to rub well with certain folks. And I, I don't want to rub people the wrong way. I'm just trying to tell the truth of the word. So that's why I try not to use pictures because pictures kind of takes away from what the word is saying because, you know, they just didn't look how some of these pictures are portraying. And so... We got to be careful about that. So another reason why I don't want to share pictures and things like that. I've already spoken about that in the beginning of the video. So let, uh, let's continue on here. Oh yeah, so I stop here to talk about Moses. He look, he knows that he's a Hebrew, but he's raised Egyptian. So that's pretty cool. He knows that he's a Hebrew. He's been told that he's a Hebrew. He's not. He doesn't have an identity crisis. He knows he's a Hebrew, but he was raised Egyptian. Okay. So, whether anybody remembers or not, he is like Joseph right now, except he was, he's basically born into Egyptian livelihood, uh, lifestyle instead of being like Joseph coming as a slave. Now, let's continue. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. 
After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. So Moses didn't like that. He knew he was a Hebrew, yet he wasn't a slave like the other Hebrews. He saw how bad the Egyptian was treating him, and he said, Oh, no, no, I don't like that. His anger got the best of him right here. So Moses was a very passionate man. We see that here, and now he's a killer. He's a killer. He's he's officially killed somebody. You know what I mean? That's crazy when you think about it. But uh, let's continue on here. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? 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 That echoed through Moses' mind. He was like, holy fat. He remembers. They freaking remember what I did. Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. <laughs> holy fat. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. So... So, yes, this is very different from the Prince of Egypt movie that DreamWorks came out with. DreamWorks kind of changed some things in it, but we're not here to talk about what DreamWorks did to it. I'm just saying that if you have seen the Prince of Egypt movie where Val Kilmer voiced uh, Moses in that animated film, which is an awesome film. I've watched it so many times. Uh, even uh, D Joseph, um, the, uh, uh, the King of Dreams, um, I've watched that as well many times. Very good films. Uh, the Joseph King of Dreams, I think that was a right-to-video, a right-to-DVD release. It wasn't in the movies, but Prince of Egypt was in the movies. And that was just a stellar animated film, you know. Anyway, like I said, they changed some things in it, but hey, if you are interested in that, I recommend that movie to anybody. Please, go check that out. Um, also, you have Charlton Heston who played Moses. Some people think Charlton Heston is Moses. <laughs> we have Charlton Heston who basically played Moses in the old um, uh, The Ten Commandments movie. And uh, every Easter, or every uh, Resurrection Sunday, I should say, my dad made a point to kind of watch that film. You know, it was kind of a family tradition of ours. So, you know, it was a long film. You're talking four hours long. That movie chronicled. Basically, they made a movie of the whole book of Exodus, basically. So it was just crazy how they made it all fit and how they made it all work. It's a classic movie. I recommend that one, too. It's a little bit older than um, uh, the, the, the Prince of Egypt. But uh, it's a lot older than the Prince of Egypt. But um, definitely something that, you know, you might want to watch. Now, they had the, these new Bible dramatization movies called The Bible, and it's basically all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelations. They made biblical movies about the Bible. And then you got the devil looks like freaking Obama. It's funny. Whoever made that video <laughs> that made the devil look like Obama. And, um... Of course, they didn't make, you know, the devil, you know, the devil wasn't like, you know, they didn't make black people, all black people evil or something like that. That would be jacked up. But, you know, like Samson was black in that movie. And, you know, they kind of just depicted people different. Delilah was a white girl. And then, uh, uh, you know, they just had different, uh, it's a different take. I think that was the newest dramatization of the whole entire Bible that was done. I don't, I don't, I think that was from Hollywood, maybe. I'm not sure who was the production of that. I didn't watch it. I just stick to reading the Bible. Try not to waste my time with those things because those things, like I said, they can depict things in a wrong way, in a wrong light, and it can kind of change what that means. So it's just best to just stick with the word. Be careful of drawings and artworks and even movies of, of how they're depicting it. They're depicting it the best way they can, right? The best way they can humanly depict it. But... You know, it's just better when you read about it. And going off of the information in the Bible gives you enough to paint the picture of what's really going on. So, uh, I've mentioned that right now you're dealing with Shem and Ham's bloodline. 
Ham being the Egyptians, I'm pretty sure they came off from Ham's bloodline. Because, you know, that's part of the black races, the Egyptians. And then Shem, you know, the brown races come from Shem, so that's where the Hebrews are coming from. Japheth, you know, he's up in the northern part of the world, the colder parts of the world. Japheth, not saying that nobody from Japheth's family probably lived in Egypt or not. I'm just saying that, you know, for the most part, Japheth and his family, they're, they're in a different part of the world. You know what I mean? Not saying that they didn't live in this part, but just for the most part, we're talking about Ham and Shem's people right now. Since this is Africa and the Hebrews are staying here temporarily. So, yeah, you know. So let's go ahead and get back into it. So, yeah, so Mo but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came, as usual, to draw um, water and fill... The, uh, draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Ah, I know Moses felt really good rescuing those girls. Hey man, if you're a dude and you're single, it's good to use your energy. Chivalry doesn't have to be dead, you know what I'm saying? Now don't be stupid and, and do the big dum-dum and have, you know, some... Some, some pre, you know, according to the Bible, pre premarital sex is not something you want to get wound up in. If you love a girl and you truly do love her and she is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen and you want to spend the rest of your life with her, do it right. Get married. Put a ring on it. I don't quote Beyonce, but if there's anything she said that I do agree with, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. I, seriously, just put a ring on it, fellas. I'm not saying to listen to Beyonce. I, I'm not promoting her. But I'm just saying, if there's anything she said that was wise, it would be that. You're better off doing that. Don't just be into the one-night stands and the, the premarital. So that stuff will mess you up. You'll be in this bondage. You'll feel connected when you're technically really not connected in the right way. It'll mess with you. You're giving your validation and authority to the girl. Now she can boss you around and you're not even in any real re marriage relationship. So you're like, it's just, it really just puts things out of order too. You know, it, it's just not right for the both of you. And it complicates issues because you could have a kid and then now you're not married. So now the parents... Your, her parents or your parents got to take care of the kid while you're not there trying to work to pay for everything when you should be in school learning something to get a better job. And it's just like, it just brings about hardship. So take it from somebody who's read the Bible and the Lord has helped me to make the wise decision. That's why I'm married to a beautiful woman. We didn't do anything beforehand. I'm married to a beautiful woman and uh, we don't have any children yet. Thank God. So we're trying to get our stuff together so we can bring our children when we finally do have them into a wonderful, nice environment that they can live at. There's, there's plenty of room for them to grow and we are at a place to where we're able to, you know, afford the costs and expenses that come along with that. So, uh, yeah, plan that junk out if possible. But anyway, back to our story. But so, uh, so, yeah, Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. So he helped them out, rescued them, and gave them water. When the girls returned to uh, Ruel, their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked, Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation and settled there with, th with him. In time, Ruel gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom. For he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Gershom. Kind of sounds like Gershwin. <laughs> and George Gershwin was an awesome composer of classical and jazz music. At the time, people saw it as trash, but um, it eventually is one of the American classics. And you know how American history and many other forms of history are. The Bible talks about it too. 
they hate people while they're alive, and then when they die, they become living legends. It's just crazy. They build monuments to them. They talk very highly of them, talk about how great they are, but when they're alive, they spat on them and treated them like crap. And sadly, that's just how it is. Uh, Gershwin was Jewish, so I don't think he was racist like a lot of the white people that he was surrounded by. Um, and so, you know, he loved... Um, um, the black culture and did music surrounding that with the jazz and everything like that because he could see the connection between the music and the culture and you know he knew where that music came from and where it started and George Gershwin is just, has some of the most beloved music at you know awesome he fused jazz which seemed to be the lowest of the low music back in that time not everybody could do it and you had to be really musically intelligent to even hang with the jazz musicians. So, you know, uh, Gershwin was very musically intelligent. And, you know, he, he looked like a white man on the outside, but he was Jewish inside, and he had no hate toward black people, and he worked with a lot of black people in his shows. So that was really cool that him and his brother Ira Gershwin did. So when, anyway, when I see Gershwin, I'm just reminded of Gershwin. Uh, that has nothing really to do with the word, but just a little side note there. Uh, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed and the king of Egypt died but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery they cried out for help and their in their cry rose up to God God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham Isaac and Jacob we talked about that in Genesis I talked about the covenant that God made through these three men the generation the grandfather Abraham the son Isaac and then his son, and the grandson of Abraham, Jacob, and how God promised that all throughout their lineage. Then he, Jacob put that over to um, Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, who um, was second in command to Pharaoh back in those times, before the times that the Hebrews were slaves to them. And so this is the covenant that God is remembering, okay? He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So that is awesome. It is great to see that God remembered his people. That is it for Exodus 2, New Living Translation. Appreciate you guys. We're going to move over to the prayer phase. For those who need that prayer, stay tuned. And for those who don't need a prayer, hey, you can, uh, you can turn off the video or continue to listen if you want. And, uh, you know, if one of these prayers that I'm going to pray is um, affects you, Please pray along with me and do what you need to do and have God get these things right in your heart. So you're a person who doesn't know the Lord. You wouldn't even think about darkening the door of the church. Or maybe you did think about it, but you know there's so much crazy stuff going on in the world and you're just kind of see, you know, you probably like, hey, it's, it's probably safer. I don't even go to a church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because of all this stuff. But the Lord has spoken to you and you've said, you know what? I realized some things from the readings that you've read, uh, bro, John Mark. And I'm like, you know what? I got to get some things right in my heart. You'll say that's you. Let's bow your head and close your eyes in respect to God. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. And I'm asking that you come inside of my heart to live. Make me clean, holy, and pure. I accept your blood covering. Take away all of my evil, wrong, sin that I have done, whether I remember it or whether I don't remember it. <laughs> Take away that sin and make me clean before you. In Jesus' name, I pray. By your precious blood, and I'll serve you for the rest of my days. Amen. You guys can pause the video, pray as long as you feel you need to, if the Lord is touching you, and we're going to continue on with the next phase. Backsliders, you all know what to do to send your first rodeo. You were once down with the Lord. Okay? You were once down with the Lord. Now, now you're down with OPP. You, you know what I'm saying? You, you're down, you're doing some other stuff, and it's... Uh, it's not right. You left the church. You walked away for whatever reason. You can come back and you, you don't want to miss the rapture. You know deep down inside that could happen at any moment in time. You need to get your hearts right with God now. You guys pray as long as you need to. Forgive who you need to forgive. Get that stuff right. I'm not going to force you to go back to a church that you probably don't want to go to for whatever reason, but get it right with those people there before you at least go to another church because what can happen if you try to just keep on church hopping and moving from church to church to church you're going to eventually just have a problem with everybody in all these different churches and you, you, you just your reputation is just going to be ruined with people. 
and you don't want that. So it's best you just get it right and just remain in the church that you're in. You want to keep on going to different churches with the same old, you know, attitude or with something. Just get that thing right. Nip it in the bud. God, Jesus said to his disciples, the axe is at the root. What does that mean? With Jesus Christ, you can take care of the root problem of the issue. Don't beat around the bush. Knock that out. Pause the video as long as you need to. We're going to move on to the this uh, the Christians now. Lord's dealing with you, you guys about something. My brothers and my sisters listening out there, get your hearts right. Get your hearts right. Pray about whatever you need to pray for, whatever it is, any need that you may have, okay? Yes, praise the Lord, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this. Thank you, Lord God, for this atmosphere of worship, this atmosphere of praise, this atmosphere where you're welcome. We're welcoming you, Lord God. Our hearts are right before you. Everybody has gotten their hearts right before you right now, oh God. Those people have come to Jesus Christ for the first time. All of heavens rejoices when one of them comes to Jesus Christ. The backsliders have returned. The Christians are now right before you. We're all right before you right now, God. So now what this does is it gets us in the position to receive from God, okay? This puts us in a position to receive from God, okay? So now, we're going to move over to the prayer phase for things that we need. Some of you guys need healing. Some of you guys need finances. Some of you guys need whatever it is. You fill in the blank. Be very specific with this prayer and pray to the Lord about what you need, okay? I don't know what you need, but the Lord knows what you need even before you ask, but you need to know what you need. And sometimes folks don't know what they need, so they pray amiss. The Bible talks about that. So, so you, And it's like you don't even know what to pray. But for those who do know what to pray and you have no questions about what to pray, come on now, let's pray. Everybody's in a good position to receive something from God. Some of you guys will receive your healing instantaneously. Some of you guys will take time to receive your healing. Some of you guys have to go to the doctor to have them diagnose you, run tests on you to see if you're healed, if you got cancer or AIDS or some deep, deep-rooted problem there. Some of you guys can feel if you're going to be healed already. If those who have pain or some type of sickness, that you can feel the difference right away. Some of you guys may have to go to the house, get rid of the bad stuff that caused these problems in the first place. That could be alcohol, cigarettes, booze, uh, distraction in the house, whatever it is. It could be some form of entertainment, uh, things that just aren't right that you know you probably shouldn't be doing. And uh, yeah, you may have to get rid of that thing before you can even get healed because God's not going to heal you, right? So you can smoke like instead of three packs of cigarettes, five packs of cigarettes a day. He, he, he's not going to heal your lungs and take out the lung cancer so you can go smoke some more, okay? So don't play with God like that. He will, he will give that cancer right back to you or he's not even going to heal you until you get rid of those things. So don't even, uh, or he's not going to give the cancer right back to you. You're going to cause the cancer to not leave because you keep on doing the habit. That's what's, that's what's happening. Let me make sure I word that right. God don't give anybody disease. He takes that junk away. The, the, the disease is caused by people and their choices and what they're doing. And it gives the enemy an open door so now the enemy can come in and mess with you and help you get the disease. But in the end, he caused you and influenced you and you decided to do the thing and it, that disease or whatever problem that you have is your fault. If it has to do with a vice such as that, alcohol, ice, whatever. You know, you took it, now you're suffering the consequences from that action. So anyway, is there anything that I've missed? No. Oh yeah, some of you, you gotta, gonna have to forgive people in order to receive healing and blessing. You have to forgive people. You can't hate people. You can't hold grudges against people. You can't be racist against folks. You know, you can't have all these weird prejudices and stuff like that and, and expect God to, uh, to help you in certain ways. You know what I mean? You've got to release that to God. And you, you, you know, so do all that, okay? Pray about those things. If you know there's something like that you need to pray about, pray about it now. Get that, work out that now. And then you have to actually go with that prayer and put action to it. And you're going to have to go, you're going to have to talk to somebody and forgive them or do whatever you need to do to get that thing right. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, without further ado, let's continue the prayer. I need you guys to collectively pray with me and our collective faith together will make this stuff happen. Touch and heal every single one in the name of Jesus. That evil, that pain, that abnormal, abnormality, that cancer, that AIDS, that pain has to leave. In the name of Jesus, you died for this with your own precious blood, Lord God. Loose it. In Jesus' name, by the precious blood, it is done. It's done right now. 
People are already receiving their healing under the sound of my voice. Gotta thank Jesus for that. Thank Jesus for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You guys let me know what God has done for you in the comments below. Tell somebody wherever you're at what God has done for you. Spread the word. Spread these videos. Share them with family and friends. Let folks know about the truth of Jesus Christ's word. That's what John Mark W. likes to talk about. May the Lord go with you. May he smile upon you. And until the next video, be safe. And I'll see you next time.